Mark, let's come back to you. And as we're being somewhat selective with this great epistle and Murray's contributions on it, we'll move along in the epistle now. Let's talk a little bit about Romans chapter 5. And Murray uh, addresses, uh, not just in his commentary, but in some articles that appeared in the Westminster Theological Journal, the imputation of Adam's sin. Mm. And uh, does some really important work on this vital theological topic. So talk to us a little bit about what do we mean by the imputation of Adam's sin, and then tell us a little bit about how Murray handled it and why it's important. Mm -hmm. Such important questions, and Murray is... Uh, particularly sensitive to their centrality for a lot of key matters of concern for the church's proclamation of the gospel and, and frankly, for the Christian life generally. Mm -hmm. um, we were noting earlier the, the dispositional mm -hmm. reality of Murray approaching the text of Scripture and um, noting how there's, uh, there, there's not just the, the scholar who is handling the text, but here is a, here is a Christian who um, clearly... Uh, is coming under the scriptures rather than over the scriptures. I think Romans 5 is mm -hmm. one of the best windows into Murray the man that you'll find in his written work. Um, first of all, when you look at Murray's career uh, as a written, in written terms, publications, a lot like uh, others in church history, Calvin is probably the most familiar example, Murray commented on Romans relatively early on he never left Romans. All of his theological essays collected in those four volumes of his writings, other things that he did, they show the imprint of a man who's been in Romans for a long time. Uh, but Romans 5 in particular, in his commentary, and you mentioned the journal articles, he, he wrote several of them that were published in the mid-50s. He had two years of sabbatical or a year and a half of sabbatical to work on them, and they're called The Imputation of Adamson. Erdman's published this originally, like they did his commentary. The articles came a little before the publication of the first part okay. of the commentary. In the Romans 5 material, you see a man who is exacting, who is uh, scientifically rigorous in dealing with the nuances and complexities of Paul's mm -hmm. truly difficult grammar. Uh, the structure of his argument is not straightforward. It requires hard work, uh, especially since there are a lot of um, erroneous views that have accrued over the years that you need to sift through to hear Paul well. Here's a man who is committed to the hard work of careful exegesis. But all throughout this chapter where you are dealing with matters of divine wrath, judgment, the, the condemnation that comes to sinners, uh, primarily but not only the forensic dimensions of our situation and our union with the first Adam, uh, where we have been imputed his sin because of a solidarity we have with him, uh, with such dark material and the exacting requirements of careful exegesis. You know what else you hear in Murray in, jo in Romans 5? Joy. Mm. This is clearly a man who is awed by the wonder of the gospel. Mm. And every now and then, he who is um, more than equipped with vocabulary, um, who, who has a great range of words to choose from, and who is careful in how he uses them, sometimes you see him as a child with a new toy running up against the limits of, of expression. He clearly loves the gospel. It, it, the whole commentary, again, of such difficult material in Romans 5, is suffused with childlike joy in his Lord. And I like to point people to Romans 5 in his commentary because you see the man, the Christian man, Murray, loving the gospel while working through its difficulties. Um, so it's a great thing to think about when you're reading chapter 5. Listen for, listen for the joy of the gospel in this unpacking of it. So what is the, 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 the facet of the gospel Romans 5 is um, ordinarily connected with most? It is this matter of justification and the reality justification reflects. Um, and this is a way in which Murray is really helpful because he's so good with nuancing. Yes, he is concerned to unpack and to clarify the forensic benefits of our union with Christ, the legal benefit of our union with Christ, that because of the identity of Jesus Christ, who is son of David and son of God, who is the second and last Adam, 1 Corinthians language, because he is that man, not a private person, but as the Puritans would say, a public person, to belong to him 
is to belong to the order that is that he constitutes, the order of reality he inaugurates with his resurrection. Otherwise, the only alternative is to belong to that order of reality of the first Adam, who, when he fell in sin, was not only made defiled, not only made corrupt, but was also judicially condemned. And his sin, which deserves the just punishment of death forever, um, because Adam was not a private man, the first Adam was not a private man, but a public one, has included all of his posterity in it. Paul is therefore moving back and forth in this epistle, in Romans 5 particularly. The death that has come to all in Adam has been gloriously reversed in the righteousness and the work of the second and last Adam, Jesus Christ, who brings life to all of his order, all who are joined to him. We call the legal part of this imputation. It's the ground of our condemnation for our sin in Adam. It's the ground of our acceptance before God in the second and last Adam. His righteousness, Christ's righteousness, is counted as though it is our own. But importantly, and, and Murray is very sensitive to this, that is not a legal fiction. It is not God declaring this because he's nice. Um, it is not God saying this because he loves you, simpliciter. Uh, no, he calls you righteous because of the reality of the righteousness of Jesus Christ to whom you truly belong. Because there is no such thing as a John and a Scott and a Dave outside of Christ to be condemned. There is only the Christ who has been, 1 Timothy, vindicated, justified in the act of resurrection from the dead. You belong to him. You have the judgment of not guilty and innocent mm -hmm. passed over you because you belong irrevocably to him. Um, so Romans 5 is negotiating these truths. And one of the helpful things Murray does in his commentary on Romans 5 is he, he carefully distinguishes how the benefits of Christ's own, as it were, vindication, his righteous, righteousness before his Father, becomes ours. He distinguishes the sense of uh, sin, the all have sinned, as a process, which was something the Western tradition really struggled a lot with up to the Reformation, mm -hmm. that we sin because we are called sinners because we sin a lot like Adam did, or in one way or another, it's the process of our sinning that joins us to Adam's sin. Um, Murray is really clear. It's not the process, it's the solidarity. Mm -hmm. It's the solidarity that Paul has in view with the all have sinned. I've, I've told students recently, and I, I think this is a great time mm -hmm. for Murray's commentary to come out again. Because among other things, we are enjoying a Bavink renaissance. And one of the contributions Bavink makes to these very issues is he, he explains how that solidarity has a, a reason. It's not arbitrary. You know, if you only think of the re reality of the solidarity, you might think, well, why did God do that? Is that arbitrary? God just set up this covenantal arrangement and now that's just how it is. But Bobbing comes in to reinforce what Murray is saying mm -hmm. by pointing to the ontological status of ethical relations, that there is a real bond among humanity within humanity that enjoys a kind of ontological status that helps us understand by virtue of our creation that how God has made us is part of how he would redeem us. Mm -hmm and join us to one atom or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a whole other table talk discussion. But, but it's a great time for Murray's work on Romans 5 to come out with the benefit of a lot of work that's been done recently within the Reformed tradition especially. I don't think it displaces Murray. I think it enriches our appreciation of what he has done. One last note on Romans 5 for now. One of the most well-known and uh, well-received commentators on Romans of the 20th century is a Roman Catholic, Joseph Fitzmaier. Joseph Fitzmaier's famous commentary on Romans comes out in the Anchor series. And he has sometimes been, I'm not sure if it's a tongue-in-cheek accusation or what, but that when he comments on Romans 5, he sounds more like a Protestant than a Roman Catholic. Mm. Do you know that Joseph Fitzmaier's commentary lists John Murray's commentary as one of the most important heavily cites Murray's commentary and was published within five years 
of Murray's commentary on Romans. Makes me wonder mm. if John Murray didn't have something to do with a very Protestant sounding Roman Catholic mm. wrestling with the contents of mm. Romans 5. Fascinating, mm. fascinating. Mm. Well, you've mentioned the obvious contrast to uh, Roman Catholic theology in how what Murray is doing. How about in his contemporary era? Uh, you, you mentioned he took a year, year and a half on a sabbatical to, to write these. Is there something in the background? Is there a controversy in the background? Is there a movement? What is, why is Murray choosing to write on this at this time? He's writing his journal articles not long after a wave of essays and studies in Pauline theology, where I think you're really starting to see more of the effects of the higher critical approach to Paul, mm. which wants to separate his religion from his theology in many respects. Um, there's also an enduring concern throughout the 19th into the 20th century with more and more iterations of a kind of Arminian strand within evangelicalism, if you will. Um, Paul, uh, John Murray certainly shows concern with that, not just in his Romans 5 commentary, not just in his Romans commentary generally, but throughout. He sees the significant consequences negatively of going down that path, going down that road, in that he shares the concern that Hodge had expressed years earlier. Warfield is, of course, famous for his concerns with this. Um, and the association of the Arminian error with the Roman Catholic error, which was well established before Murray's Day, I think might have something to do with why he decided to spend so much energy and attention on Romans 5 especially. There's also the work of C.H. Dodd in the background, and that was a very influential Pauline uh, scholar who has some views here that we're gaining ascendancy. Uh, for one reason or another, maybe those are all the reasons, maybe there are more. Mm. He certainly does double down on his efforts in Romans 5 for a good span of time yeah. in the uh, mid to late 1950s. Wow, fascinating. Can I ask, can, can I follow up? What, what can you, would you be able to summarize for uh, people in the pews why it matters if you think about imputation mm -hmm. as immediate or immediate. Is, it, is this an academic discussion? We all enjoy the classroom, or does this, does this ever get to the, to the pews? It is a, it's a really good question, and it is important, although it may not hit the pews in exactly that form. Yeah. Um, it, it, a lot of it comes down to how we need to understand the peace with God, Romans 5, 1, that we have through our Lord Jesus Christ. How is it ours through our Lord Jesus Christ? It's not by way of something the Spirit does in us, or through us, or among us, uh, in addition to the fact that Christ is ours and we are His, uh, any more than we are sinners uh, because we have a disposition passed to us from Adam of old. Uh, no, there is a reckoning that takes place of His act of unrighteousness, whether it's sing considered singularly or as a collective, the act of righteousness which is reckoned as ours point blank. And then there's the act of Christ's righteousness, combining his suffering, his death, and resurrection. There's the act of righteousness that is counted as ours as such in an imme immediate way. Mm -hmm. The immediate, reality, immediate possibility for, was a way of explaining how that sin might trickle down to others mm -hmm. in a way that wanted to account for some apparent advances in anthropology and in the sciences uh, and in cultural studies, those have largely gone the way of the wastebasket, the, those alleged advances, and yet the idea has persisted. Murray is quite helpful in pushing back against even some representatives in the reform tradition from years earlier when it comes to the necessity of seeing immediate imputation as central not just to understanding our relationship to sin, but as key to understanding the gospel mm. as including, not, not exhausted by, mm. but including the forensic or legal dimension of being counted righteous for the act of righteousness on the part of another mm. and attributed to, to us or reckoned as ours, not because we are lovable, but by virtue of our union with the one who has been counted righteous. Mm. Yeah. His justification, strictly speaking, is what becomes our own justification. Yeah.